Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. In just a few days, we'll bid farewell to 2023. We hope that throughout the year, Another View has served to educate, entertain, and enlighten you. So we'll take a little time on this last Thursday of 2023 to reflect on some of the issues, stories, and conversations that kept you tuning in. Whether it's history, culture, or health, we hope that we've brought you an overview that captured how these issues are viewed in the Black community. By hearing and sharing another view, our goal is to increase understanding and narrow the racial divide. The best of another view 2023. That's next, right after this news from NPR and WHRO News. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the best of Another View 2023 edition. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. We begin our look back at the past year with an Another View on Health, where we discussed over-medicating our children. This particular topic resonated strongly with a lot of our listeners, For this riveting discussion, I was joined by my co-host for Another View on Health, cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby, clinical and pediatric psychologist Dr. Gretchen Lefevre Watson, and the managing training director of the California Youth Connection, Sade Daniels. Let's take a listen. Are you aware that in 2022, Virginia ranked 48th? out of 50 in terms of youth mental health services, and that Hampton Roads has the highest ever documented rate of psychotropic drug use among children. Why are so many of our young people on these drugs, and what is the long-term effect? Gretchen, tell us, what is a psychotropic drug, and what does it do? A psychotropic drug can refer to any number of different types of drugs. So if you think about drugs that are used for depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, any of those kinds of problems, even psychosis, those are psychiatric or psychotropic drugs, and they affect the mind and also the body. Mm -hmm. So it's a large class of drugs that have become very commonplace. And were they designed for children? They were not designed for children. Um, What happens with psychotropic or psychiatric drugs is they get tested first on adults, and then later um, the boundaries are pushed to see whether or not we can use them safely and effectively with children. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that there's a documentary called Medicating Normal. It did air on PBS. It is really a film that reveals a lot of information about being on a psychotropic drug for a long period of time and what that can do to people and then what can happen to them when they come off of the medication. There's a population of particularly um, African-American kids that are also being um, treated with these drugs and that's in the foster care system. And Sade, I want to bring you into the conversation because you actually were a part of the foster care system in California um, and you experienced being placed on these drugs. Can you tell us about your story? For myself, as well as the work that I've done in my adulthood, a lot of my experience centered on congregate care placement. So the group homes, which is actually um, disproportionately used for African-American children. In those group home spaces, like young people are considered more behaviorally challenged, which kind of creates this pipeline towards psychotropic medication. So you'll see in the state of California, at least, and as well as many other major states with like high populations of African-American children, you'll see that there's higher rates of psychotropic medication being given to those kids that are in the most restrictive placements who just so happen to be African-American children. Mm -hmm. For myself, I recall going to a psychiatrist for 10 minutes (laughs) talking about my feelings when I was 13. And after 10 minutes, um, I was diagnosed with manic depression. And at the time, I didn't really understand what was going on, but I was also offered um, medication for sleep. So in my mind, I was just 
just like, okay, if y'all are going to medicate me, can I at least get something that would help? Because at this point, I'm not sleeping very well. And so, and I remember taking the, a couple of days later, taking the medication and just the effect that it ended up having it on my functioning. So I, I we call it, uh, we were zombie in. That's what we called it in the mm-hmm. placement. And that's basically like we, we, our feelings are numbed. And I'll never forget it because we were told, you know, it doesn't necessarily take away this, it just takes the edge off. Um, so you see a lot of younger black kids in foster care being diagnosed with these really, really big diagnoses, manic depression, bipolar, at times when our brains aren't even fully developed, and also in a space when trauma was never adequately addressed. Mm. When you talk about these kind of medications, uh, the first thing in my mind is, you know, you know, ha- has the underlying problem been addressed that created the issue that is looking to be treated? Because medications aren't just, you know, aren't the answer to everything. You have to look at, mm-hmm. you know, why is this tra- what happened to the person that's making them, making a physician think they need the medicine? And once that been addressed or has it been addressed, you know, is it being used in conjunction with talk therapy or is mm-hmm. this just like a pacifier? Um, Dr. Newby was saying, you know, it's hard to get a handle on where we are now, and it is hard to find the numbers and understand how this plays out. For example, if we look at the most recent report in Virginia, children in foster care compared to other children on Medicaid who are not in foster care are five times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. 10 mm-hmm. times more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety and depression, which makes sense. Um, and um, we think, well, a diagnosis of anxiety and depression might be okay because these children are anxious and depressed, but not so much. When we put that label on the child, we're saying there's something wrong with the child, that the child has a disorder. There's something in them that needs to be fixed. When who among us wouldn't be anxious and depressed if we were just ripped out of our home and a home where maybe things had been um, far from ideal Mm -hmm. all along. Uh, It it doesn't matter. You still know home and you still crave to be in your familiar place. So we would expect children to be anxious, depressed, and exhibiting a lot of um, troubling behaviors, but yet they're getting diagnosed with um, conditions just way too often. And in Virginia, we know the CDC has looked at this. They looked at all 50 states and how often each state uses, for example, psychotropics to deal with children who've been diagnosed with ADHD versus behavioral treatments. And Virginia um, has the highest level of drug use and the lowest level of non-drug therapies for ADHD. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that 75% of preschoolers with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are receiving drugs as treatment. The CDC recommends trying behavior therapy first. In February of this year, we traveled down to Edenton, North Carolina, where there was controversy over whether a Confederate statue in the center of town should remain or move to a new location. The issue was so contentious that a coalition of groups that wanted the statue to remain in place sued the town of Edenton and the townspeople on both sides of the issue were protesting. What do you say to people who say you want to remove the statue because you want to erase history, because you want to get rid of what happened in terms of the Confederacy. How do you respond to that? I'll start with you, John. The stature and what it's about, it has to do with slavery, oppression, white supremacy. When you do the history on it, you know, when the statues came up, where it was put at, you know, across this country, it was about keeping black people, if you will, in their place. Susan, same question to you. Those that say you're trying to erase history. Um, History is our bread and butter here in Edenton. We would not erase it. What we have displayed publicly says something about our current values. 
And having this symbol of white supremacy erected as such, moved as such to its current location, having it front and center is a message that is inappropriate for a town that depends upon visitors, for one thing, to to make its bread and butter. It is also so much in defiance of the values that were important when this was the cradle of the colony and when people came here for a more egalitarian life. After the Civil War, when the white elite, my ancestors, did not like it that black people could now vote and be serve in government at all. When they decided they better suppress this with such things as putting up the statue, but more significantly, of course, the voting laws that were enacted then, they were acting in defiance of the values that were important to this place being founded in the first place. And we would have the opportunity to tell that. There were veterans who believed in a cause who died in the Civil War. Yes, that happens in every war. And their story could be told along with this longer lasting story. So we have an opportunity to tell a whole story of that particular war and its aftermath Mm -hmm. unto our present time. We ask for representation from the North Carolina Division, United Daughters of the Confederacy, the North Carolina Division, Sons of the Confederate Veterans, and the Colonel uh, William F. Martin Camp, 1521, which is a local unit from the Confederate Veterans Camp near Edenton. As they are in litigation against the town of Edenton, they opted to have their attorney, Ed Phillips, speak for them. I think instead of removing history or moving it someplace else where it's not really going to be seen, it's better to place other monuments honoring those who have either never been seen or heard in the public forum in terms of memorialization or who have been forgotten and nobody really wants to talk about them, which is unfortunate. For example, in Chowan County, as I understand based on the history, there were 12 freedmen who fought in the Revolutionary War, and one of them, I believe, have heard this and, and seen documentation that he was in the Continental Army. And so, you know, these are men, African American men, who should be honored, and they're not. And to me, that is not telling the full story of history or the full arc of history. And to me, having children of color being able to go to a park or the county courthouse, et cetera, to see somebody who resembles them and understand the history and their connection to this nation that has had a, a, an arc of history that has been you know, good, different, bad, glorious, and horrific. So his solution would be add more monuments, don't mm-hmm. take down the monument that's there. As a Human Resource Commission, we kind of looked at all of those different kind of options about putting some other things up there, but not leaving that particular statue there. Mm-hmm. To leave it there and to put something else beside it, to say that it's okay and that you put something else beside it, um, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't that interested way. in that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's go to our audience. Do we have any questions, Lisa? I'm Michael Dink. I'm a member of the Martin Camp Sons of Confederate Veterans. We have been picketing these wokeism people down here for almost a year. That memorial is a collective headstone for over 48,000 North Carolinians, white and black veterans, that died and didn't come back. They wanted to put it on 6th Street, which is all the way at the back side of the cemetery where nobody would see it. And so this is about veterans. There are many people in this community who are afraid to speak out because they'll lose their jobs, Mm -hmm. lose their housing, or be thought of as rebel rousers. So even speaking out now, you know, it's possible my job could be on the line. So there is threat in the community for blacks to speak up. There is not equality in this community. North Edenton looks like a blighted place, while down here is beautiful. So I'm asking the wealthy, powerful in the town to have empathy and understand we're not trying to destroy your history, but relocate it and give a history that is for all people most of the time. 
Despite a unanimous vote by Eatonton's town council to move the statue, a restraining order keeps it in place, and people on both sides of the issue continue to protest. What are your thoughts on natural hair? Have you embraced your natural curls, or are you more of a braids, twists, or locks person? There are probably as many ways to wear your hair naturally as there are colors to choose from. But not everyone is on board with the natural look, particularly in the workplace. In April of this year, we talked about societal attitudes about black hair and why women and men are fighting for the freedom to wear their hair as they choose. Joining us to talk about this is Sadiqa Reynolds. She is CEO of Perceptions Institute, which did a major study called Good Hair. I want to bring in Danielle Saunders, and I want her to share an experience that she shared with us during our production meeting. I am a classical musician at heart, um, and I've been doing it for a while. And I got a chance when I was a freshman in high school to do a really step up orchestral program. And it was very rare for for people in my school district to go. And it was two of us from my particular high school, both of us black women. And we were very excited. And I remember once we got through the actual audition process and we got into our particular groups that we were performing in um, I had gotten second stand um, so in an orchestra you have so first stand is your first and second chair um, and second stand is third and fourth chair so I had gotten third chair second stand which was really really big for a freshman and I remember I had there was a parent um, and she told me basically that I needed to have a more polished and professional look for the upcoming performance. What was your hairstyle? I had a little baby afro. And And she told you you needed to look more professional? Yes. And I remember I did not know exactly what that meant, but I knew I felt embarrassed. Um, And I remember going home to tell my mom and my mother that night washed and blow dried my hair and stretched it out even bigger and did the most beautiful braid out I've ever seen in my life. And so I came back on show day and it was even bigger. (laughs) But how did it make you feel? I think that was the first time I really experienced a anxiety attack and just worried about how I was being presented in front of an audience doing something that I loved. You told me you went home and you cried. Yes, I did, I did, I did. Okay, thank you Danielle for sharing that. Sadiqa, that's not an unusual story that we hear about our young women and our older women, for that matter, when it comes to our hair. No, and I think that what is happening to us across the country is what has always happened. Anything that is different than or seen as different than that of the majority, we are being othered and being told that it is less attractive. And that's what we found with the Good Hair Study in 2016, less attractive, less professional. You know, these are things that white women think about us. Certainly, we know white men, powerful positions, the same sort of treatment of us. Anytime it is anything different than what the majority sees as acceptable. So I'm so sorry for what Danielle experienced. So no congratulations on being able to play so high in the orchestra. Exactly. No conversation around, you know, her exceptionalism. Her, her her talent, none of those things. But instead, let me tell you what it is that I don't like about you. Let me tell you why people may not be able to um, really hear you. They they may listen, but they, they don't really hear you because your hair is a distraction. And that's that's part of the narrative. That's what we hear in this country. And that's why you're seeing the Crown Act be passed in, you know, 20 states, because we really do need proactive protection. People cannot be left to their own devices in this case. Um, and so that's why I think we're seeing the more and more uh, states pass the Crown Act to protect black women. Crown stands for Create a Respectful an open workplace for natural hair. I hope that what has changed over the last six or seven years in our country, because we do now have a Supreme Court justice who is wearing her hair natural, because we do Mm -hmm. have a first lady who showed up in braids a few months ago. So, you know, what I think is that the world is changing, but the world is not changing fast enough. The 
those folks in the majority uh, who are really the decision makers, unfortunately, um, the policy makers, we are seen as different then and and not accepted. There are all kinds of biases, and so we we have to deal with those things. And one way to do that is to proactively pass laws that actually protect us. And the other part of it is that representation matters, and that's what I want to get to when I talk about mm-hmm. the Supreme Court justice or the, the former first lady showing up with, with natural hair. Being able to turn on a television and see yourself. We have a, a colleague who works a lot with, you know, cartoons and and. and uh, you know what does the character look like? How is the how? Mm-hmm. What does the hair look like? And Aya talks a lot to us about what the experience is for her child to be able to turn on the television to see hair that looks like hers that is curly and tight, and to identify that in a positive way. So often those those things about us, our hair, skin color, they're they're demonized, and so. I think that our country has moved somewhat. I do not think it is enough, and it certainly isn't fast enough, like on all of these other issues that we work through. But in this case, I hope that we will see more and more legislative changes. Since our broadcast, an additional seven states have enacted the Crown Act, bringing the total number of states that have passed legislation to protect against hair discrimination to 23. You're listening to the Best of Another View 2023 edition. Please hold your calls. Founded in 1776, First Baptist Church Williamsburg is home to one of the oldest African-American congregations in America. It was started by enslaved and free blacks who wanted to worship God in their own way. Much of the history of the church was untold until now. Back in May, we shared what has literally been unearthed about this important part of America's history. We welcome back to another view, Connie Matthews Harshaw, president of the Let Freedom Ring Foundation. Hello, Connie. Hello. (laughs) Glad to have you back. Reverend Dr. Julie Grace, she's an associate minister at First Baptist Church of Williamsburg. Hello, Reverend. Hello there. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. And Jack Gary, director of archaeology with the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hey, Jack. How you doing? I'm great. Good to have you back again. How many graves do we have now, Connie? 63 is the last count. Yeah, that's right. As of last week. Think back to the first uncovering where we discovered that there were actually graves there. And think back to what your immediate emotion was. I was angry first, to be honest. How could someone put a parking lot over a burial ground? And then when I got over that in about five minutes, the science kicked in. I thought, okay, there's validation. We were told the oral history has pointed us in this direction. But I tell you, until Jack and the team took the top off of one of the graves, that was the most emotional part for me because Mm. I stood there looking down at a skeleton and I heard this whisper saying, it took you enough time. We've been waiting for you. And that's when I lost it. I got in the car and I said, oh, my God, what in the world have we done? And they've been waiting for us to 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 find them. To find them. Yeah. Talk about that process to bring in the descendant community. They were voiceless before that. You know, they would sit on the sidelines and talk about what wasn't going right and what had been done to them and all this, but without the opportunity to be engaged. So once we organized and we got them engaged and we started asking questions, this was before we knew about intact burials. Um, The process just worked out. And uh, just like Jack said, we did not make a move without talking to the descendants. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to do one thing, which was to verify that they were of African descent. And we thought... With three graves, we could do that. And Mm -hmm. uh, we relied on the scientists to tell us which three. Okay, so what did you find? We chose three that would give us a spread across the cemetery. Um, And what we found is uh, the preservation of the bone, unfortunately, is is pretty poor. But all the other evidence that we were able to find, including DNA evidence from one of the individuals, which came back as a person of sub-Saharan African ancestry, Mm -hmm along with artifacts that confirm that they were buried in the cemetery at the same time that the first 
building was being used, built and used by the congregation, it came together that this th- these are the ancestors. So we used a lot of different lines of evidence as a you know, really interdisciplinary program mm-hmm. to, to get these answers. All lines of evidence point towards these are the ancestors. Now, I do know that the descendants are really interested in finding out whether or not, you know, they're related mm-hmm. to those people in the grave. But we do understand that it's not possible to do that. To do um, all 64. To, to do all 64, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. And so from my perspective, if we can't uh, actually detract enough to tell us whether or not, you know, is that my descendant or is that your descendant, then I would prefer that we just, you know, we just let them just let them rest. So, Connie, what's the plan? <laughs> we're going to talk to them this weekend and we're going to open up the discussion about how they want to honor those that are buried, those 63. I think that's a significant symbol. We're working with the uh, Paleo descendant group. Mm-hmm. We're working with the uh, memorial task force of that group to talk about how you do that and how you do it so that it's consistent with the fabric of Colonial Williamsburg. And that it also rises to be one of the areas that will be most visited. Um, It needs to be a contemplative site. It needs to be a prayerful site, a sacred place. So um, we're going to talk to them about that. And then we're going to work with Colonial Williamsburg to see if we can make it happen before Mm -hmm. October 2026. In addition to the archaeological dig that discovered 62 intact graves at the site, the rebuild of the original church structure is scheduled for October of 2026. Six months ago, I sat down with outgoing Norfolk Police Chief Larry Boone in one of his final interviews before leaving Hampton Roads to take the position as top cop in Urbana, Illinois. During our discussion, he addressed the challenges of policing while black, changing the attitudes and biases of overzealous officers, and convincing black and brown communities that change is possible, but takes time. So you and I have been talking back and forth, just kind of looking at policing in general, and and particularly the role that African-American police chiefs play in terms of making a difference, in terms of reform within the department, as well as recreating trust within the community. And there was an article in USA Today, Black Chiefs Pushing Police Reform Face Racism, Anger from Officers and Their Communities. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about when you became police chief, um, which side did you decide to tackle first <laughs> or did you have to balance them both? So um, that, that's an awesome question because I came from within. Okay. I relied on my relationships that I had built over 30 plus years that my officers knew who I was. So my, my intensity mm-hmm. uh, was focused with the community, which is why we were so heavy towards community relations. Mm-hmm. That became a handicap after George Floyd. Um, and I say that because um, I had conducted myself in such a fashion was I was going to be transparent. I was going to level the playing field, so to speak, Mm -hmm. and I was going to be accessible to the community. So three prongs. Number one, after George Floyd, the activity with Black Lives Matter, me marching with them, I knew that would be problematic. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, I did a lot of first in the Norfolk Police Department. Too many to name right now, but for an example, the very first African-American female assistant chief to level the playing field, did a lot of firsts. I knew that would be problematic. Um, I had one particular promotion. I think it was my last promotional ceremony. I had a lot of diversity and some very powerful positions. Mm -hmm. And lastly, um, having to make a a discipline decision that required me to terminate a lieutenant. I knew my days were numbered because in any organization, you have 60% that's going to do the mission. You have another 20% that are just, I don't care one way or the other. Then you have that other 20% that's going to be the squeaky wheel, that's going to get Mm -hmm. the attention of city council, that's going to galvanize 
to get rid of you. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw that formulating. So you saw it coming. Absolutely. So when you decided to march in the Black Lives Matter protest, talk to me about your thought process, knowing you're the police chief, knowing it could cause issues, um, but you marched anyway. And I think a lot of our listeners would love to know, what were you thinking about? Why was that important to you? My th- main goal was this. I did not want anyone in the precinct uh, getting injured. I didn't want mm-hmm. the protesters getting injured. I thought that my, my best option was to calm them down, which I did. And they wanted me to march with them, which I did. But I knew I was going to get severe pushback. And I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, nobody got arrested. There was no property damage. Um, and I had some work to do to try to rebuild my relationship with my officers because they did not like it. Um, they flat out did not like it. Go ahead. You know, when I uh, became news director at one of the stations here in town back in the 90s, and I was the only African-American female news director in the top 50 markets at that time, and I got a lot of pushback from staff who would say to me, well, why are we doing that story? It's only because you're black. Is that the kind of pushback or some of the kind of pushback that you may have gotten from officers when you would try to implement reform? And any police department, particularly for a black chief, because we intersect both parties, the black community and law enforcement, race always comes up. Promotions and discipline. Mm-hmm. Always. And when you are leaning too heavy towards community relations and requiring your officers to do things they're not comfortable in doing, you're going to get pushed back. I remember, because I had some dynamite officers that were willing to do just that. Mm -hmm. And I recall one particular officer, white sergeant now, that I promoted twice. Um, There were some things I required you to do for promotion. And he came to me almost in tears. He said, Chief, I, I want to do what's right. I want to embrace your vision. But I just had a sergeant say, why are you following Chief Boone's mission with these kids. They're nothing but future felons. Mm. How do you change that kind of attitude? I I think it's easy if you're from the inside, okay? Like I said previously, I came from the inside and everybody Mm -hmm. knew rather, I didn't care who you were. If if you stepped out of the line, I I was gonna hold you responsible. Mm -hmm. And you do it by one, giving that individual one, an opportunity to be heard. In addition to that, you, you have to hold them accountable for everyone to see. Mm. I played no favors, um, black or white. Is there a major issue that Urbana is facing that so, you're aware of? One of the things that, that sticks out in my mind, um, you know, just in conversation with some of the community members in Urbana, you know, I'm talking about things we take for granted here. Give me an example. The reading program, wow. okay? The okay. chess program, the, the, the clergy program. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, just multitude of things, you know, having an MOK march. Wow. You know, the fact that if I go somewhere, I want my command staff there with me, you know, just and they're excited. And there are people who are sitting back going, but that's not policing. Policing is pull up on the bad guys and lock people up. those, those, Those days are gone by the way of the dodo bird. Okay, now there are folks that need to go to jail. Okay, we know that. But we also know that if you start building those relationships, those authentic relationships with mm-hmm. community members, they're going to call you. They're going to talk to you. You're going to be able to solve crime much faster than you ever would because the real the reality of it is nine times out of ten, we solve crimes through somebody talking to us. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we're some talented people, but we need the help of the community, and they're not going to help you if they don't trust you. As for his work as the top cop in Urbana, Boone says his goal is to connect his department with the community, with the media, and various groups to make Urbana a better community. You're listening to the Best of Another View 2023 edition. Please hold your calls. In July, we spoke with Major Mark Lotta, a cardiac care physician associate and accountability and life coach for Black men. 
Dr. Lada shared his personal life challenges and how he's used more than 25 years in medicine, education, wellness, and the military to reimagine manhood and reinvent himself. When people would congratulate me or when people would say, great job, I didn't know how to handle that. I had no yeah. idea because that imposter says, well, there are other people doing it better. Or you made a mistake here. Instead of being able to say thank you mm-hmm. and just move on, mm-hmm. I would always offer excuses. No, 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 not me. I, there's other people that do it better, or I, I did the best yeah. I could. Yeah. Instead of just saying thank you. So some, a couple things happened in your life kind of back to back to back that really forced you to start reexamining who you are. Can you share with us what, what I, they were? I, Unfortunately, my big brother, he's the most unselfish guy I've known. He, I, I called him uh, Fred Sanford. In his <laughs> life, you know, he had a, a great social life with everybody in the community. He was a handyman. He restored things. He just was an amazing man. And in uh, December 9, 2017, unfortunately, my brother was murdered. And, and even more unfortunate, it was my father that found him murdered. So from that standpoint of a son and a father is something you would never, ever be able to understand unless you are a father. So to this day, you know, I commend my father just for his strength. Following mm-hmm. his death about two months later, his granddaughter was with my mother, and she made a comment about him being murdered. And my mother, you know, in the uh, Dr. Nube, as you know, in the African-American community, we have a lot of hypertension, a lot of high blood pressure. And the comment made my mother's pressure go up and she had a stroke. Mm. And that was three months after my my brother's death. And she never returned home. So for the next two years, she was in rehabilitation in a nursing facility. I'm here in Delaware and I would finish 24 hour shifts and get on the road and drive down there to her. And. Blessed. It sounds kind of weird, but I'm I'm blessed. She got her wings on February 20th, 2020. Mm-hmm. And if you re- remember, that's about a week or so before we shut down for, for COVID. COVID. Yep. Yeah. And I would have lost my mind if I could not have seen my mother. But she got her wings. Um, I got to spend those last two years like in depth with her. Mm-hmm. And then last year, um, year before last, um, I had a routine surgery, a carpal tunnel release. And the surgery went wrong. Uh, so we're in the surgery. I woke up with low, uh, less function in my left hand. Uh, there was lack of sensation. And through rehabilitation and therapy, I was able to get my function back. But I still have numbness and tingling and lack of feeling on one side of my left hand. And as a cardio surgical uh, physician associate, I, I have to be able to pay attention and get instruments. And so I no longer am able to do surgery. I uh, just do critical care now. And then that last thing that hit me just last year, my father was diagnosed with lymphoma. Mm-hmm. And it was a scary part for me because my, my father is, is my true ace. He's my, my true role model. And I hadn't even thought about what would have happened had he left. And, and with talking to him, he felt like it was done. So between all of that, you know, it, it made me question life in a lot of ways. Because, again, all those things that you read off in my resume are erased right now. Wow. So who am I? What am I? I was defining manhood based on my accomplishments. And we can't do that. And we, yeah. So those, those are, the, the I think, the things that really made me as a now a 53-year-old uh, realize manhood and how transformational it is. And, and that was done at the age of, what, 51, 52? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, that's the bottom line of why elevated man, black man needs to exist. So tell me um, then, um, Mark, what is elevated black man? The beautiful thing about Elevated Black Man is it's, it's conceived through, um, again, just my, my position in life. And mm-hmm. so the way I look at it is, you know, it, it, it's a commitment to empowering black men through self-awareness, which we don't do. Uh, self-reflection, a lot of us definitely don't do that. Education is very important and using my five pillars of health, uh, including accountability and being able to collaborate with other black men. And that helps us to, you know, become better selves because they say black men don't talk, but we actually do. Mm-hmm. Uh, in closed sur- close, uh, circumstances, we talk about sports, we talk about women, we talk about a lot of things. However, those things that really are important to us, um, we, we don't, and it's mainly because we don't feel safe. So what Elevated Black Man does, it creates an environment where men can absolutely be transparent. It, it's, it's where we can, I want to get men close to vulnerability um, within the circle of commune men mm-hmm. uh, for society, maybe not as vulnerable because, again, we still are attacked on a daily basis. But I want to have us at that level of 
comfort. So it's a foundation for opportunity for men to self-define their versions of black manhood. Mm-hmm. Anti-racist space. That's, that's huge. An anti-racist space. Mark, I want to ask you a question. This journey that that men should take, regardless of where they are in life um, and when they decide to do it. Is this a solo journey or can the women in their lives play a significant role? So that's, that's very tricky. Um, very, very tricky. I think the journey in itself, um, the mm-hmm. introspection part, is the hardest part for men. Um, we have to be able to look ourselves directly in the mirror. And, and I have friends, a lot of people, I say, no, in the morning, instead of just brushing your teeth and, and getting out, stand there and look at yourself for about 30, 40 seconds. Because you can't hide for yourself. You have to have that mission. Now, my um, marketing person who's helping me develop all of this, one of the things that she said is men do listen to their wives as well. So we want to have this this open for women to kind of understand because that encouragement from that important woman in your life, even whether it's your wife, your girlfriend, or your mother, as in uh, Dr. Nuba just spoke of. So I think primarily it's a journey for men, but the mm-hmm. support of women is definitely necessary. It's definitely necessary. We listen to, to women a lot, even though we might, you know, buck a little bit, but we hear what you say. That's also part of manhood is being able to be vulnerable with people that you love. Mark is the founder of Elevated Black Man LLC, an organization that addresses sociocultural trauma by creating anti-racist, safe spaces for African-American men to connect and grow. Back in August, we took the show on the road for a live broadcast from Fort Monroe in Hampton. We were joined by historian Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, sculptor Brian Owens, and the founder of Project 1619 in Hampton, Calvin Pearson, as we commemorated the 404th landing of the first Africans to English North America. Calvin has uh, led a grassroots effort since 1994 to tell the true story of 1619. There's been a lot of controversy around 1619. So take us back and tell us exactly what happened in August of 1619. Well, we go back 404 years. We found out, not by Jamestown, but we found out that a, a pirate ship, which was an English ship, landed along these shores in August of 1619. And on that ship were what we call the 20 and odd, the first enslaved Africans brought to English North America. Three or four days later, the treasure arrived, which was another English pirate ship. Between those two ships, we now know that there were 32 Africans brought ashore here at Point Comfort, and they were eventually sold for food. But those 32 Africans were eventually transported to plantations up and down the James River. One of the key stories we try to tell is that of those 32 Africans, only one went to Jamestown, only one went to Kings Mill. But for the past 400 years, Jamestown has dominated the story of the first landing and trying to convince people that all of the Africans went to Jamestown. So we're trying to correct the narrative because history is based on facts. It's not based on folklore. It's not based on tourism. And that's what we've been facing for a number of years. And you've been doing this work since 1994. I, 1994, I uh, approached Jamestown and I said, your narrative is incorrect. And they said, no, your narrative is incorrect, which made me go out and want to prove it. <laughs> Uh, Jamestown had documentation since 1620. When John Rolfe wrote in his journal that during the latter part of August, a ship arrived at Point Comfort with 20 and odd Negroes. Mm -hmm. It's been there since 1620. But Jamestown took that passage and took out Point Comfort and put in Jamestown. And that's where the false narrative has been until we changed it. So, Cassandra, when we talk about this history, a lot of times people say, well, okay, that's where it started. But these 20 and odd Africans had a life. They were real people. Can you talk a little bit about what they brought to America? You know, what were the skills? What were the the things that made them whole people, not (laughs) the chattel that ultimately people began to think of them as? Well, you know, one of the things that you have to do when you talk about enslavement is you have to take the human being off the table. 
and make them things, make them like animals, property, without a past, without a present, without a future. They're just there to serve me. And so many of these Africans who were forcefully brought here had an entire culture. Some of them had actually been converted to Christianity and not just by the Portuguese, but in their homeland. Many of them came from the kingdom of Ndongo. Some would eventually come from the Congo and from the Cameroons, that whole West Central African area. And they, they brought skills. They brought agricultural skills with them because these were fully grown people who were living free in a society, in a kingdom that was very advanced, very prosperous. Mm -hmm. And so many of the things that we forget is that once the tobacco industry, for example, started in Virginia, many of these Africans had already been producing tobacco in West Central Africa for generations prior to that. And they produced a type of pipe that was very popular among the Europeans when they started uh, utilizing their skills in producing this. And it became one of the economic driving forces. They would either chew tobacco or they would put it in a pipe and smoke it. You didn't have cigarettes mm -hmm. at that particular time. And, and so that was a little bit part of the economy. But the other thing is the maritime industry. In West Central Africa, a lot of the, and also in West Africa, a lot of the landscape was similar to the landscape here. A lot of rivers, a lot of their estuaries had, were, had been overrun. So you had the rivers flowing basically into the ocean and they knew how to navigate fast moving rivers. They understood that pattern. That was not something that the English knew. If you've ever been to England, you've maybe punted along the Thames or the Cam <laughs> River. Um, you know that their rivers are rather narrow and and it's not like the rivers here. You cannot throw a coin across our rivers around here <laughs> because it you know you're talking about in some cases a mile or more. And so the, the rivers were fast moving. They understood navigation. They came with those skills. They understood how to build ships. And so we, uh, I guess Americans in general have created this false narrative that somehow civilization did not begin until white people walked on this continent. And that's why history often will not begin until their arrival, as if nothing was there before. Never mind that the English took over native towns and, and communities and then renamed them and claimed they built it. So th all of that false narrative is a part of why Africans from West Central Africa in particular were often not named or if their names were recorded, they were lost, documents were not kept. And that's also why the skills that they, that they brought with them, the knowledge, the intellectual knowledge, uh, the culture that they brought with them has been absorbed. We have taken away people's contributions and their culture and appropriated it and refashioned it to be like what Calvin was talking about with what Jamestown did to this whole narrative, refashioned it into mythological status instead of sticking with truth telling. Brian Owen's sculpture commemorating the first landing is set to be unveiled in August of 2026. It will be housed at the African Landing Memorial Site on the campus of Fort Monroe. New York Times bestselling author S.A. Cosby joined us in September for an inside look at his new book, All the Sinners Bleed. This was also the perfect opportunity to get a closer look at the man behind the riveting and engaging stories that keep his dedicated readers coming back for more. One thing that, that is always amazing to me is, is 
how you come up with these plots and the storylines <laughs> because every now, you know, as soon as you think you've kind of figured out, okay, I know where this is going, here comes something else at you that you just go, <laughs> wow, where where did that come from? I learned the oral uh, tradition of storytelling from my grandmother, my grandfather, my uncles, my aunts. And so couple that with just my voracious reading habits as a child and then being around books. I, you know, we grew up in a household, you know, we weren't, as financially advantageous as some other families, but we had so much love and so many books around us. My mom read mm. biographies. My grandmother read romance novels that I probably shouldn't have been reading. Um, that's where that stuff comes <laughs> that's from. That's what I was going to say. That's how you got to write <laughs> my darkest prayer. I got it. <laughs> yeah. My uh, my uncle read detective novels like Mickey Spillane and John D. McDonald and Ross McDonald. And then my, other, my aunt, who lived next door, read uh, Stephen King novels and horror novels. And so wow. I was just always surrounded by storytelling. So between him Hanging out with my uncles around the the, the, the grill during a barbecue mm-hmm. or hanging out with my aunts um, when they were uh, making Thanksgiving dinner or just sitting around listening to my um, my mom tell stories. I've always been surrounded by storytelling. So it's been uh, something that's been in my blood my whole life. You know, it's really cool also to listen to or read about the um, references to our area, to southeastern Virginia, <laughs> in your stories. So it just it just kind of really makes it come alive, especially for those of us who, who live here. So let's talk about All the Sinners Bleed, since that's your latest book. What is it about? So basically, All Sinners Bleed is the story of Titus Crown. He's the first black sheriff in a small southern town. On the one-year anniversary of his election, there's a tragic shooting at a school, and a local teacher is murdered by a former student, and that former student is confronted by Titus' deputies, and that former student is, is, dies as well. And in investigating the shooting, Titus uncovers a horrific crime uh, right under the nose of everyone in town that the teacher, the student, and a third mystery person were a trio of uh, serial killers, mm-hmm. and their victims were um, young, um, you know, teenage black boys and girls. And so Titus finds himself drawn to this mystery. Uh, he has a, he feels like he has a moral responsibility to solve it, while at the same time dealing with the every day, you know, day in and day out minutia of being a sheriff in a small town, you know, with mm-hmm. all the things that are involved in that. And so uh, for me, the story really is about a person who stands up for the least of us. You know, I like yeah. to think of Titus as a as a knight errant, so to speak. And so he he's the one that decides, you know, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to stand in the gap between the darkness and the light for the people that I care about. Relationship is important to you in your mm-hmm. books. Yes. Yeah, most mm-hmm. definitely. Definitely. Because I think for me, like there are only there are only four or five plots in writing, <laughs> you know, man versus man or man versus himself, man versus nature, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that, you know, that's a given when you start writing. For me, what makes, or what I try to do to set my writing apart, or the writing that I love reading, the the writers that I admire, are writers who really delve into the complexity and nuance of relationships and how that affects character. For me, character drives story. You know, um, Mm -hmm. the plot is the car, but the character is the person behind the wheel. And so that's what I always try to emphasize and focus on when I'm writing. So where do your characters come from? You know, how do you... (laughs) I'm laughing because everybody that I know that I went to school with, everybody wants to be in the book. Like, everybody, (laughs) it's like, is that person me? Is is that based on me? Or what I love is when they they pull me aside and surreptitiously kind of whisper, is that person based on so-and-so? And so so (laughs) (laughs) And I always say yes, because everybody's, in the books, everything that I've experienced is, is is in the books. But as far as the characters, they're amalgamations of people I grew up with, people I knew, people I admired. Um, sometimes I like to say that they're they're people that I knew turned up to eleven, both in the negative and the positive. And so mm. I try to take everything I grew up with, everything that I was surrounded with as a child, and I take that to make what I hope are true characters and not caricatures. And, and so for me, it's very important that my characters are real people, that they're fully fleshed out individuals with highs and lows, with good and bad points. And so for me, again, that's what drives the story. You know, a murder mystery is, is a plot as old as, you know, Cain versus Abel. But for me, it's the characters that mm-hmm. add a different flavor to it. And that's what I'm so focused on when I write. In a New York Times review, another best-selling author, Stephen King, called All the Sinners Bleed a, quote, well-told novel of crime and detection. 
We hope you've enjoyed the best of Another View 2023 edition. For producer Lisa Godley, audio engineer Jordan Christie, Dr. Barry Graham, and all the wonderful people who share their insight and talents with us each and every week, thank you. I'm Barbara Ham Lee, and we'd like to wish all of our Another View listeners a safe, happy, and prosperous new year. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org.